In this episode of the Houndsman XP Podcast, we have a returning guest. Mr. Joe Condellis of the Western Bear Foundation is back with us on the Houndsman XP Podcast to update us on the work of the Western Bear Foundation, the projects they worked on on 2020, and what we've got to look forward to in 2021. You're not going to want to miss this. You're going to want to listen to this podcast and hear ways that you can get involved to preserve bear hunting in the United States of America with hounds. Thank you for spending your time with Houndsman XP, and it's time to dump the box. How's your hunting season been going? Well, I had a real good one this year. Um, you know, between Montana and Wyoming, we had a lot of fun. Uh, so, got filled out all my three tags in Wyoming or in Montana, and uh, uh, my daughter filled all her tags in Wyoming. So, it was a really good year. Good. What you? What uh, three tags did you draw from Montana? I had just general deer and elk, and then I drew an antelope tag up there. Okay. Yeah. So I shot a, a pretty nice bull uh, in in late October, early November, and then went back up and shot a nice mule deer. And I had an antelope tag for an area that wasn't like a big antelope area, but it was kind of where I grew up hunting. So I just went back there and 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 shot a decent buck in October. So that is a good year. Yeah, and then my daughter killed a real big bull here in Wyoming on her tag uh, at the end of November and got a doe whitetail and a doe antelope. So we got a freezer full. Good for you. I, I, I'd say it's a, a good time to have a full freezer. Yeah, yeah, no kidding, man. I yeah. I had one more tag that I kind of piddled around with with a, a cow elk tag. I didn't fill it, but... I was just going to kind of give it away anyways. I ended up giving some meat to some people because I was kind of running out of room. So I was able to share a little bit too, which was nice. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. How about well, you, buddy? Oh, just uh, bear hunting and and uh, doing some coon hunting back here in Indiana. I'm kind of laying low close to the house this year. I went on a, some pretty big excursions this year. Yeah, and, you were busy. I followed you quite a bit. Just all over the place yeah yeah i was all over all over the place we spent about i spent about two and a half months up in the flathead valley we were doing some roofing and and then we'd slide down to uh gibbonsville idaho and and uh run a few bears here and there and, and things like that so yeah we had a good time all year so i grew up right on the other side of gibbonsville in montana in that wisdom country oh no kidding in the big hole yeah Yep, in the big hole. That's where I grew up. My mom and dad, my dad had a house there in Wise River, and uh, I spent most of my hunting and, and fishing time up in that upper valley, Wisdom Country, all that. So I've been on that Gibbonsville Road a bunch of times. That is a wild little road right there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yep, yep, it's for sure. That's it's cool. A, yeah, that, that's, talk about a small world. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, one thing I always was never, when I lived in Montana, I never hunted in Idaho much, and I wish I would have because it was uh, so close, and I've always, I still haven't yet to run uh, bears with hounds, and I was like, man, if I lived closer now, I would definitely run over there and do it. I mean, I'm still not far, but I uh, still haven't done it yet, but man, it's just right there, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's just, we, we would cut, because when I was coming from Bozeman or that direction, Every once in a while, you get a wild hair and cut over the the Gibbonsville Road, and mm-hmm. uh, just just take in some back country because you're just tired of you know hard paved road driving. And but yeah, that whole area all the way. I always dropped in from Anaconda and then mm-hmm. uh, wound in. What's that river that runs through there? Is that the what river is that that runs all the way down through that valley? The Big Hole River. Is it the Big Hole River? Okay. Well, yeah, if you come in from Anaconda, you'd go over Mill Creek Pass, and then you'd hit the Big Hole River, and then the Big Hole goes all the way up, and the headwaters of the Big Hole are up in Wisdom Country. Yeah. Man, that's that's just beautiful country. It's it's uh, it's remote, no cell phone service. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yep, it's awesome. I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, it was like only, still only about five hours for me to get there, though. So that's where my antelope tag was, up by Wisdom. Okay, yeah. Uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Michael Ritchie, runs an outfit there. His, his uh, area is there in the big hole. Up Steel oh, okay. Cr- up Steel Creek. Steel Creek Yeah, Outfitters. I know Steel Creek well. I know Steel Creek really well. 
Yeah. Yep. So we grew up hunting elk uh, from about Steel Creek east. So Steel Creek, Doolittle Creek, McVeigh Creek, all those creeks that kind of come off of Steel Creek there, the, that head down towards Wise River. Like that's every, I mean, that's the only place we ever elk hunted. So I, I uh, that's pretty cool. Small world. You know, one of the funniest signs that I've, it was funny to me when you come out of Anaconda and I'm going to, I don't know. I know how to get there. I don't know the names of the roads, but you come out of Anaconda and you drop down into the big hole um, right there by the black stacks. You know where that's at? By the smelters there. Yep. Yeah. So you take that road south and yep. you go, go down through there. Well, you get down there a little ways and there's a sign that says California and it says Crick. Somebody yep. took somebody painted over the E E and put an I C in there, California Crick. And I, I looked at that <laughs> and I thought, that's funny. That is funny yeah. stuff right there. I know right where you're talking. That was always funny when we were growing up there. Like we hated that that was called California Crick. And then there's like Wisconsin Crick there and everything. Like all these different Crick names are all the states. And it's right there in Mill Crick. It's, it's pretty funny right off the road there. Yeah. Yeah. For an Indiana guy that, you know, says Creek and then everybody out there says Crick. <laughs> Crick. That, that cracked me up. I thought that's a yeah. fun. Somebody's got a good sense of humor right there. <laughs> Even if they are defacing public property, I thought that was, I thought that was well worth it. <laughs> Heck yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, well, Joe, I, um, we kind of know what we're going to talk about and I'll just introduce yep. you and we'll just roll into it and, uh, uh, but Joe Condellis, I welcome you back to the podcast. Second time on the podcast with the Western Bear Foundation. Do you remember? Do you remember what episode you were on the first time? It was it was last summer, so it had to be. It was last summer, I remember. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the number, but I, I feel like it was pretty early on. But it, I know it was. it was last summer. Yeah, it was. It was early on, and and uh, really enjoyed having you on there. With you know, of course support of the western bear foundation through the podcast and stuff and and the work you're doing out there and and uh i just wanted to have you back on and uh get a get an update on some things happening with that uh are happening to our bears in the western united states and and what the western bear hunter found it bear hunting foundation is uh or western bear foundation is doing in your work out there so can you fill us in yeah, yeah, and it's it's been a, you know a little over a year I guess since our last conversation, and it's been a busy year, uh, especially for kind of on the ground work that we've been doing. We actually um, that summer, last summer when I talked to you, we were in the beginning stages of uh, collaring some bears out here in Wyoming for uh, what was uh, set up to be our a large population study for black bears in Wyoming, one that we funded uh, a large portion of the callers. To do so and so mm -hmm. as part of that study we ended up getting the University of Wyoming to jump on board and now we have a fellow uh, grad student down there doing work uh, with just black bears and the study data that we're collecting right now and so really excited to have uh, someone working down there at the University just on black bears and then the department out here in Wyoming is uh, committed to doing trying to get every range uh, mountain range in Wyoming that 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 has a suitable and a substantial amount of bears in it um, collared so we can do a full-on statewide you know get an estimate on population rather than using harvest data so mm -hmm. right now what what ends up will happen this summer is the collars will fall off the black bears we have collared in the, in the bighorn mountain range and those collars the data we get from that the spatial data we get from that will help us determine a grid pattern to go put out hair snares to collect the individual hair samples so we can get individual DNA. And yeah. then what the university is going to do is they're going to take that hair, that hair data and they're actually doing a harvest vulnerability study. So they're going to plot bait sites and, and hunting, hunting locations of where they're baiting and uh -huh. use the collar data to see how often bears are using bait sites. And then they're going to be able to look at like the isotopes in the hair and determine if that bear is a, a you know a bait dependent bear if that bear's ever hit baits and so we're going to use uh, the information that we have to kind of do a couple of studies outside of just doing the the population and so those you're throw, you're, fall you're, off you're throwing a lot of information at me there that i've got a lot of questions yeah. for yeah so and, uh, so, so the first thing is so the first thing is 
the collars fall off the bears. So I assume they're a biodegradable collar that has a shelf life and things like that. Actually, they're pretty neat system. So they're a, they're a GPS collar that actually has a, it's got a popping mechanism on the collar that you set a timer on it. So no we kidding. set the timers on it. Yeah, and then that collar will pop. And when it pops, it releases the buckle and the collar will just fall off the bear. And then we'll go retrieve those collars and hopefully refurb them because a brand new one of those is close to $3,000. Wow. So we can get them refurbed if they need repair work or whatever and, and put them back out on bears and, and, and on, on carnivores to do more work and, you know, to, to try and buy those every year. So the first year we bought t uh, 10 collars, it was $20,000. Mm, that's so, substantial. Yeah, and so this year when we did the study in um, – the same collar uh, work we did in a different mountain range, we, we had some extra collars from that and some refurbed ones. So we were able to not have to purchase collars this last year, but the year before we did. So yeah, they, mm -hmm. they're a pretty neat deal how they do that. And then hopefully we can collect them up and uh, refurb them and get them back out to use. So what's the, uh, what's the craziest thing you've seen? Uh, this is well off topic, kind of a sideline, but what's the craziest thing, like the most beat up collar? Have you got any that they've got, uh, teeth and fang marks or anything through them like that where they can't be refurbed or <laughs> you know it'll be interesting because we haven't seen any that have been on this long on black bears like i haven't personally so a part of this study this is the first round of collars that'll fall off so it'll be pretty interesting to see but i've i've seen some grizzly collars that have had some chew marks in them and yeah and pretty beat up and, and yeah. pretty nasty and you know, a lot of the bears that we've got that we collared in the bighorns were some smaller bears, and we didn't get that real mature bear that was probably close to the end of growth. So now we'll have some bears that are probably ready to get rid of those things because they grew up a little bit. Sure. That's going to be uh, what I'm hearing you saying. We need to check back in with you and get some stories about some of these collar recoveries because a bear, yeah. li bear lives a pretty daggone hard life. I mean, they're not they're not the most graceful animal, and, and they can be pretty rough on stuff. I, I'd, yeah. like to, I'd like to see some of those collars. And as, as I was happy to report, I don't think this summer they've told me. So the department's managing it, you know, um, because they, you know, legally we can't be out trapping and collaring bears on our own as a nonprofit. So they're managing right. it, but, like, they keep me pretty up to date on uh, travel and stuff all summer long. I was seeing some of the, the movement patterns and then haven't heard any mortality signals uh, this year. So hopefully they're all in their den sleeping away. And we did lose a few the first uh, the first fall to hunting but uh that's okay we had quite a few extras collared so yeah yeah and the other thing that you said in that in that first uh comment there was uh you are going to be able to set out hair snares and then determine through the hair that you capture whether or not this bear is hitting baits or he's not hitting baits is that is that what you said yeah, so okay. and this will get a little bit over my head because um, I'm just a dumb business student, but um, the biologists in the world know probably what we're talking about. But evidently what the plan is is we're going to collect some hair data, and then they're going to be able to run some of that hair and, and look mm -hmm. at the isotopes and the carbon, um, yep. something to do yep. with carbon and, you know, uh, what their natural food is versus uh, non-natural food. It will show up in some of their hair mm -hmm. um, through those isotopes. And so – with the grid that they have of actual bait sites, because we have to register bait sites in Wyoming, <clears throat> they can look at the bear's travel, see if it's using bait sites, and then um, they'll also be able to use that, that data from their hair to determine if they're, like, dependent on it or not. Because mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a theory in a lot of these areas where, like, large, big, mature boars don't and, – and bears supplement with bait, right? They don't use it primarily as their number one food source. Um, but there's a theory that, you know, the, some of the larger, bigger boars and mature bears are just using it as a way to, you know, gather up sows, and they'll hit it a little bit. But we didn't end up getting any big boars collared, but we still kind of want to know more about what happens with bears as they age and how frequently they hit baits. And, and some of that, that forest that we trapped uh, a couple years ago and collared, is really unique in the top portion of it is very high elevation and wilderness, which you can't bait in. And mm -hmm. then like the bottom of it from about, you know, 9,000 down is all national forest and, and places you can bait, but snow limits access in the spring. So we kind of are curious is if there's a lot of bears or a large population of bears that aren't even using baits that don't, 
they, they don't come out of den till late and they're, they're, they're frequenting areas where we can't access for baiting. So we just kind of want to learn more about that, that, that population set in the bighorns and, and that similar thought process will happen for all ranges, you know, so we can get a better understanding of bears movements on the landscape, how they're using bait, how they're using natural food and, and how healthy the population is. Okay, and then and then just real quickly, tell us how that transfers over to uh, influence on hunting regulations and, and hunter opportunities and, and things like that, Joe. Yeah, and that's what I'm most excited about because in Wyoming, we're still set on a female mor- or mortality quota. So our seasons aren't set by date. So we have an opening date, but the close date's op- the close date's set as well, but we usually don't hit the close date because we'll reach uh, female mortality. So each district has a set mortality quota for females, and once that's hit, it closes, similar to mm-hmm. like lions and stuff. And so because we have that, we, we probably err on the side of caution for harvest. Like we can probably take a lot more bears out of the population, increase hunter opportunity, but because we don't know a population really here, we have to use that method. And so by doing this and being able to get a better idea of the populations in these ranges, it really opens it up for opportunity to increase harvest opportunity, you know, increase hunting opportunity. So, you know, if we find out, well, the bighorns in the north end is the only place we're studying. In the north end, there's X amount of bears per square mile. That's more than we ever guessed. Um, then that's probably going to equate to a higher harvest and maybe, you know, changing of the female mortality quotas altogether. And this is all open-ended, we don't know yet, but th- sure. that's our, that was one of our main goals for doing this was to get a better understanding for bear, of bear populations in Wyoming so we can increase opportunity for hunting. And, and also, you know, there may be some instances where we have to look at it on the other side of things and say, you know, we, we don't have the population we thought we did here. So maybe we need to back off a little bit. What's your What's your prediction? Do you ha- Do you have a prediction? What's your gut tell you, Joe? When the when bighorn you... is going to come back a lot more bears than we anticipated. Uh huh. Yeah, it's going to come back, and and I I fully expect. So we're in a three year season setting cycle in Wyoming. Um, our our bears are so we don't do carnivores every year. Um, that is due. I think it comes up in two more years. So I bet in the next season setting cycle we see a strong increase in harvest uh, quota in those areas and probably a breaking out of actual units um i i wonder if instead so the top part of the bighorns is is um all like one and two hunt area one and two is combined under one mm-hmm. quota and three and four is combined under one quota i think we might see those separate out and each one have its own quota and probably a lot higher than we already are seeing i i just i, I i've got a strong belief that there's a lot more bears in there than we than we know and then and then you're going to push for uh uh, the ability for me to come out and run run bears with my hounds, right? I would absolutely <laughs> love if Wyoming would do that. I would too. I I, uh, I I get a lot of calls and a lot of people ask me what it's going to take, and I, I don't know that we'll ever see that day, but it's something that we would support 110% and, and sure. help out however we can. I think it'd be an awesome deal. Yeah. And so so when you're when you're collecting these da- this data, uh, when you're doing these studies, uh, how are you capturing bears? Are they, is everything trap or are you using houndsmen to catch catch bears for collaring or, or what are you doing we there? Did, yeah, so we do two different methods, uh, lake snares and, and culvert traps. Um, uh-huh. And so what the neat thing and, and what a lot of people don't understand is how much time it takes the state agencies to do these studies. And, and it was a pretty big surprise to me too. I went with these guys and did some trapping and, you know, they have to spend most of the trapping period, which is in the summer on the mountain. Um, away from families and friends and they rotate in and out but we at any given time like six or eight traps out or snares out at at, at one time and we'd have to check those first thing in the morning and get them checked and if there was a bear in it we had to work it up do a full workup on it and get it released and try to do all that before it gets too hot in the summertime so they're not stressing themselves out and so all our all our snares and and traps were baited with just like some uh, blood scent um, mm-hmm. maybe some roadkill carcasses and, um, and most of them were culvert traps, but a few, few, few snares were put out as well. So I, I assume that you've got a bear in a culvert trap or a, or a lug snare, and then you're using a, a punch stick to, to inject the, the dart and the, uh, the serum in there to, to make them sleepy. Then, 
then at what how long does it take you to do a complete workup on a bear after it's after it's uh Oh, it doesn't take too long. You know, once it goes out and it's down enough, then they'll get a collar ready. They'll do all the blood work and everything on it, get the collar on it, and then get up and on its way pretty quickly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't take too long. It's just, you know, in the in you know out here out west, it, it does get hot in the summertime. And yep. the, the big thing is just not getting those things to where they're 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the straight sun, uh, you know, in a culvert trap or in a leg snare i mean they will torch a tree in a leg snare i mean it's incredible what they can do in the short amount of time because they're checking these traps every single day mm -hmm. and so yeah it was a it was a big commitment from the agency the the wyoming game and fish department and the large carnivore team they're they're just awesome to work with here um and they really wanted to see this get done and so it was uh, it was really neat to just see kind of the the two organizations come together and get something done on the ground for something that we're super passionate about and and their guys are as well yeah so when when you set up a study like that you mentioned having a graduate student uh from what university university of wyoming or wyoming what'd you say yeah U university wyoming um and that came on after they kind of saw the work that was going to get done for some uh, large carnivore stuff in Wyoming with the black bears. And, uh -huh. and they have uh, they have kind of a special school down there where it's, it's part of the university, but they work mostly on wildlife conservation issues and stuff like that. And so they, they had one professor, associate professor Joe Holbrook, jumped on and started trying to think about some other really neat ideas that we could do because we're already trapping bears. Mm -hmm. You know, we're already going to get hair samples. So now we have you know, we have that valuable information that they can use to pull some other information from this study. Yeah. So, so what happens if, if I understand, from what I know about these things is, you know, the department would, would contact the university and, and, uh, offer an opportunity. Uh, I've heard of that before. Is that kind of what happened here with, with the uh, university of Wyoming? It's like, Hey, you know, we got this program going on down there and yeah, and I don't know the specifics of that. I'll have to ask Joe. I don't know if the, the school and, and Joe reached out to the department or vice versa. Um, I think traditionally the they'll, the department will reach out because mm -hmm. th these students spend a lot of time compiling information, working on the ground, doing a lot of stuff, and it's part of what they want to get their master's or graduate degree in or whatever. And so it's a it's a kind of a win-win. Yeah. I know some of them are probably work – for it, it doesn't cost and you know ours ours does cost a little bit of money each year um more so just to for facilities and and all the you know stuff to get out and do the studies yeah so the department benefits and the student benefits because the department needs the manpower and and the help and the student needs a, a project or a thesis for his master's degree correct yeah yeah, so that's a that's a win win for both parties there. A great collaboration to work for black bears for sure. Yeah, something that we've needed out west uh, in particular. They're doing something similar in Idaho that we're the department's just kind of doing that on their own. Um, but it's good to see you know black bears finally getting some love. I know we we kind of take for granted that they're just uh, they're there and that they're healthy and and we don't have to worry about them. But we always need to be kind of cognizant of understanding. W w we don't know enough about them out here out west you know there's just not enough information i think the last wyoming study done was in the 90s mm -hmm. and it was only one mountain range so it and it was done by a graduate student uh, i believe at the university of wyoming i don't know of anything that's going on back east though either i mean in-depth graduate study work uh in in collaboration with a with a state agency to really study black bears uh, most of the most of the data and the intel that comes back from the east is based on uh, you know things like harvest data, mortality data, whether it be roadkill or or whatever, and then uh, uh, conflict, human human bear conflict, and uh, you know what kind of problems that they're actually causing, and then then they you know they they compile all this information but as far as you know really knowing what's going on with the black bear other than some place like the great smoky mountain national park where i know that they do some uh lab field laboratory type work you know most of these black bears are are not being studied at, at a level that we're getting any good hard data back on them 
No, and, and it's funny you mention that because uh, I was going to mention this in our in our talk today, but we're in the works right now on putting something together in Virginia, actually. So, you Great. know, we, we do a lot of work out west, but we will help and do anything we can anywhere in the United States and Canada for bears. And, and I, I can't really speak too much about it because it's getting finalized, but we are going to be putting together some stuff right now over in Virginia with – with their agency and it, it's going to be a pretty in-depth work and they're really passionate about the black bears in their state and wanting to understand more and there's some things that came up that that kind of leads us to get involved and so i'm really excited about the potential for that that's that's a win i mean that really yeah. is that's a win for uh the black bears and and the hunting public and the public that wants to enjoy black bears because you know wildlife management without hard data uh you know, for instance, in, in this isn't black bears, but this is raccoons. When I worked for the state of Indiana as a conservation officer, every year we did a, uh, a, a fur bear survey, and it was based on road kills. And if we passed a raccoon on the road, then we were supposed to uh, document where it was, the sex of it, the, the you know, and... and um, things like that and then we would turn these harvest or these data cards in at the end of the at, at the end of the month there were certain months that were designated as that well i mean I, I i'm almost embarrassed to say but it wasn't something that was taken real serious you know yeah it, it, it's it's not something that you know if i'm if i'm running from call to call and then to think that that i'm going to stop uh when i've got a person that either I need to go see, or I've got a call or something like that. So a lot of times it was just like a guesstimate, you know, of, of what it was. So it, it's good to see that there's actually some good hard data that's, that's being harvested out there and, and help formulate a real plan. Yeah. And that's the challenge too. I think that's where we stepped up a little bit is, you know, is putting the pressure on a little bit more, like asking some harder questions to some of these state agencies, like, Hey, you know, I, I, I bugged the guys in Wyoming for four or five years, you know, just to try and get something like this put together. And so it's not that I think some of these places don't want to do it. It's just that there's like, well, there's some money here that we're going to put to this, to this, to this. And maybe it's just not front of mind for them, black bears. And so I think it helps having us out there just kind of like, hey, what are the chances of doing this? And maybe take two or three years of bugging them in there finally like, you know, that that we can put something like that together. Because at the end of the day, we can only do so much. You know, it's going to rely on them to, mm -hmm. to get out on the ground and do a lot of the work. So it is a hard ask sometimes. But what we've tried to tell people and help people understand is, you know, because certain animals and species in this world are, are on the brink or um, their populations are not as strong, they, they tend to get more money. Now, grizzly bears, for instance, since we, we talked about this on the last one, you know, we can study them until we're blue in the face. Right. We, we kind of know what we need to know. The population's increasing. We have them everywhere, da, 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 da. But we, we've studied that population so much, and we don't yes. study some other species that maybe we don't know enough about just because we take for granted that they're out there. And hey, they're doing and great. You know, they're in my trash. They're fine. They're in my trash all the time, and, you know, we yep. don't really need to. And you take something that's on the endangered species list, and and millions of dollars are thrown at that, and... And a lot of times, some of the other some of the other wildlife on the landscape ends up suffering because there's so much attention, whether it's you know political or or you know real. Just a lot of money thrown at that stuff. It's sexy, you know. It's sexy. It it's sexy to study grizzly bears. It, it really is, and and you know the the departments, state agencies are pretty well hampered because uh u.s fish and wildlife service is is requiring some of the study work you know and so mm -hmm. it's a little tough on the state agencies and you know bear work it's it's funny i've talked about it a little bit you know in-house and you know it's hard to get money for it because i can't tell you that you can send your whole crew down here if you if you spawn if you if you're a if you help support a study that we're a part of you know, like when you go on a sheep study, you get to send 50 guys out that gets to take their picture working up a sheep. We're not going to have 50 guys out working up a bear. It's just a liability. So yeah. bear work is, black bear work is not sexy. It doesn't have a lot of appeal to, to uh, donors because they can't, you know, sling their product as well with it. And so it, it's been a challenge to even get money for black bear work, to be honest with you. Um, 
some of these groups are just like, and even grant writer, grant funders are just like, ah, oh, we don't want it. We, we're not interested. Well, I was going to, I was going to ask you about this and it's a great place to jump in. So, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things have been on their head and during 2020 with the COVID and, and, uh, you know, I've watched the NRA have to cancel, they canceled their convention. Shot show is canceled for 2021 already. Um, just a lot of a lot of people had to recalibrate the way they were doing things. What did what did you have to do during the uh, the COVID deal to yeah. recalibrate and and keep the lights on at the Western Bear Foundation? Yeah, and thankfully we're all volunteers, so we don't have to pay an employee. You know that was a that was a great thing that came about. You know we just didn't have that extra stress you know on top of trying to find work money for work on the ground we didn't have to you know keep someone god forbid employed so we had less of a i would say less of a burden than a lot of other organizations that are non-profit or conservation based because they have staff mm -hmm. and that that had to be a stressful situation for both staff and people that were making the hard decisions we actually end up you know a lot of our money comes from me writing grants or or doing donate getting donations or doing like uh fundraising events and we typically have one fundraising event a year and they're not large scale we have one like bigger one and then we'll do like some smaller stuff in different parts of our our, our kind of montana idaho wyoming area where we have volunteers and we had a pretty large event planned in march and we had uh, Billy Moles flying in to do be our guest speaker, uh, and and he was going to fly in and do this. We had this pretty big event planned, and that was going to kind of set us up to do some stuff for the year. And we had to cancel that and mm -hmm. cancel the venue and cancel Billy. But we had all the stuff, you know, some of our our raffle prizes and some of that stuff. So we kind of had to shift to doing it online, which is new for me to like sure. try and give all sure. this stuff away. And we had to sell tickets for it. You know, we were going to do all that there, and so. We ended up getting some money that kept us kind of going this year. Um, and then a lot of the larger funding that we got was just from grants. And so it's been tough. Like this year, we didn't even plan one. Um, we're talk we talked about doing the same thing. And I said, let's just hold off because I don't want to set something up. And as you know, we're getting into a really weird time mm -hmm. where who knows what's going to happen. I was like, if we get into March and we're on some shutdown or something, then we got to cancel again. So we kind of pivoted and we're doing a large raffle this year where we have a, a Wyoming commissioner's tag up for raffle. We had a great commissioner here for Wyoming that donated one of his, his uh, licenses to us. So that gives uh, the winner a choice, deer, elk, or antelope, any part of the state of Wyoming for any open hunt. Nice. And so we'll generate some money for that. And we've kind of earmarked a lot of that money for our, our study work uh, in Wyoming and then some stuff in Montana and Idaho. Um, we'll, we'll work on getting that funded through grants and stuff this year. Well, remind me at the, before we before we wrap this up to circle back around to that because I want to tell our listeners where they can uh, either purchase a raffle ticket or support the Western Bear Foundation. Uh, Absolutely. So make sure we circle. It's it's your responsibility, Joe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for an ink pen here. I don't see one on my desk. So. No, uh, <laughs> that's okay. I'll try and remind you. All right, all right. Yeah, you better because it, it's a uh, it's it's possible money for the Western Bear Foundation. So yeah, yeah. I was just curious. I mean, I've, I've asked several, several different groups that we've interviewed. Uh, anytime I have a group like yours, then uh, trying to find a strategy. Everybody, everybody is kind of feeling around in the dark right now and trying to relearn how to do this, whether it's, you know, like Freedom Hunters that we partner with or the Wisconsin Bear Hunters. Everybody's trying to figure out how do we survive post-COVID. Or yep. how do we pivot and and survive? Because you know we don't have we don't have Hollywood millionaires writing hundred thousand dollar checks to us every other day, but we still no. we've still got to have money in order to uh, do the work that we're doing. So yeah, and one thing I've talked about to a lot of people is that it, kind of an impact that doesn't get talked about a lot is how COVID is going to impact conservation and work for wildlife because all these agencies and all these groups like us, the nonprofits of the world that kind of advocate for a, a specific species or for conservation are running out of money because we couldn't do fundraisers. And so that that's a negative effect on our wildlife. And, and I don't know if a lot of people have really thought about that. We're so worried about our own 
uh, you know, selves that we forget to what, what's happening out there with wildlife because of this. And so the money is a lot harder to come by, too, because now all these people, all these groups can't fundraise like they used to. So they're relying on grants. And so that that pool is the same amount of money, but it, the pie, the pieces of the pie are getting smaller. Mm -hmm. So it's just getting tougher and tougher. And I don't know. And th we were never at a stage where we were like having large scale, three, four, 500 people fundraisers, but everything matters to everyone, you know? So even our small ones were very important to us. Sure. Um, sure. And so it, it, it all hurts and you just, it's really hard to say no when someone calls and says, I want to do a, a electric fence on my property and I'm, I'm working with these guys and, or the a state agency calls us and says, Hey, can you help us do this? Um, and we can't afford it. You know, we got to tell them no, because we have to prioritize our, our projects too. When the money gets tough, you know, in the ideal world, we'd just be able to fund every project that comes our way. And, Sure. And we would we would push out some of the anti hunting groups that are funding these projects. That's a dream of mine is to have less defenders of wildlife funding projects and more Western Bear Foundation funded projects. But are you man, they have are money you like that? we don't. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, in Montana especially. You know, and the, see the problem the problem and we've talked about we've talked about the thing that you just said is uh, we've gotta find a way to continue to fund these things because uh, wildlife hunting uh, conservation are all going to suffer and yes. um, it's kind of like we've we've done it the same way for a long time uh, you know going back to National Wild Turkey Federation the, the original banquet Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation came along after the NWTF and of course they've got state chapter banquets and that's where we've always raised our money friends of the NRA stuff like that and they've taken away you know the the ability to gather has has really made groups take a hit this past year so we've got to find new ways in order to fund that and the problem with like defenders of wildlife who are getting free money they don't have to have an event because somebody's writing nope. them a big check and they've got That's money to throw have. at it that sportsman groups don't and now they've got a seat at the table and they have a say because exactly. they've got an investment and we've never we've never had to deal with that before because we could always say that hunters fund conservation yeah and it's it's what i'm seeing with defenders and sierra club and even some of the side groups that maybe don't say they're anti-hunting but when you really dig in and 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 get through the weeds on their stuff they're they're not a pro or or a, a neutral um even they're they're against hunting is they they're the state agencies need money to do some of these projects, especially for conflict yep. mitigation. Yep. And so they reach out. Well, and, and you know, a lot of that comes from is what the biologists, the biologist or the, the game manager or wherever at the time in those areas will reach out to who's funded them in the past. And usually defenders has an endless amount of money. <laughs> yeah. It seems even like to me. And we've tried to call, and, and we're we're in pretty good uh, place in a few places in Montana where I, we might not be the first call, but we're right on the list. And, That's great. And it might not be that much money, but we're given some. So it's like, hey, you know, and we're, we're a part of the conversation now as opposed to just solely going to defenders. Because the last thing I want is one of those groups to hold sway over wildlife management. Yes. Yes, I agree 100%. And money is neutral to a state agency. They don't care where it comes from. But, no. you know, what happens is, is the players that are involved in taking that money in, you know, I've, I've been in these meetings where, well, you know, we have to, we can't just kick them to the curb. They're our biggest, they have really supported us. So maybe we need to, even if it violates the original mission of the agency, they're still beholding to where that money's coming from. Yeah, and, and it's, it's just like the lobbyists in in the federal government. <laughs> you know, yes. they give enough money, they sway your your allegiance, and then they sway your mind yep. uh, towards their their agenda. Maybe a little bit because they're getting money from. Yep, yep. So the message here is: look up the Western Bear Foundation and hunters out there that that don't want anti hunters setting your policies and support the Western Bear Foundation. <laughs> You know? Yeah, and I, 
It depends on what state you're in, too. You see it proliferating in Montana a lot worse than you do in Wyoming. Um, we're real red in Wyoming, sure. and uh, we tend to keep them kind of groups at bay. Um, Montana is a little bit of a mix, you know, and, and there's some – I think there's some biologists within that department that are non-hunting biologists, and and that's a that's a tough thing when you got right. a non-hunter that's a wildlife biologist that determines hunting seasons and counts and everything, and and defenders gets a hold of them or Sierra Club, that's bad news. Sure, sure. Well, let's shift gears a little bit, and I want to talk about the, uh, and don't forget to remind me to tell people where they can find you. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the lawsuit that's that's going on in the Ninth Circuit for the bear baiting issues in Idaho and Wyoming. Yes, uh, it's been a big thorn in my side for the better part of a year. <laughs> um, it went from being a, what I thought was just going to be a scare tactic to a full on. Now we're going to go to court and the, the judge is going to hear they're going to go and hear it. And so basically what ended up happening was three groups or four groups and, and Western watersheds. And I think it's uh, wild earth guardians. I don't know if Western watersheds, I know wild earth guardians. Um, there's a few, I could pull it up basically are suing. I guess they're suing the U S fish and wildlife service and the U S forest service because of black bear baiting on national forest. Yes. Um, yeah. Essentially, what it boils down to is they don't want bears being baited. They hate it, and they're going to use the grizzly bear as a means to an end. So they're using the grizzly bear as a way to get their agenda through of no bear baiting on national forest in Montana and Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And right now, it all boils down to in 1994, I believe it was, there was a letter that came out from the Forest Service that basically said, hey, you know, this letter says that we're fine with bear baiting on national forest as long as there's no incidental takes of grizzly bears. And now they can't prove that there would never be an incidental take of grizzly bears. Right. So they have to rewrite that and maybe go for a consult between the U.S. Forest Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And, and, you know, there's no way to ever say there won't be an incidental take. Yeah, so, the, the, la the last ruling that I saw was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or the, I'm sorry, the Forest Service, had tried to say they wanted the case dismissed based on the fact yep. that they had done things to mitigate the risk of incidental kills. And the court, court came back and ruled that they had not done enough to ensure that that was not the case. Is that accurate? Exactly. Yeah. And, and it boils down to it, the frustrating part is the states have the authority to manage their bait seasons and have them where the forest service came in is they're the overarching, you know, for the national forest. And so mm -hmm. because that they didn't do enough to, I guess, um, investigate the possibility of, uh, incidental take, um, the judge said, no, that these guys have a liable, they have a, a viable court or a viable reason to, to pursue this. And, and we're going to listen to it and, and go through it. And, now, the state of Wyoming and the state of Idaho and the SEI are all involved in this with uh, the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the DOJ. Mm -hmm. So um, they're kind of uh, heading it for all of us because they're all probating. that They need that and they want that. And, and, you know, we came in early on and we're kind of rallying the troops. I sent a letter to the director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and U.S. Forest Service with uh, member with sign-ons from probably 30 organizations that said, you know, this is why we believe baiting is important, why we need it, why we want it, and the effects it has on grizzly bears. And we, we thought, you know, it's very minute, you know, maybe 10 bears or so they figured since, since the 90s. Um, and, you know, just to try and say we can't afford a big lawyer, and, and this is our, our way of trying to voice our opinion, and mm -hmm. I reached out to – I reached out to the Sportsman Alliance and SEI and had great conversations with them about it and was glad to see SEI jump on board. You know, we, we kind of depend on them as a greater organization that has a lot more money and power than we do to, to help fight some of these things for us. So, Well, what, for, our, for our listeners who may not be aware, who we help, one of, our, one of our overarching goals with this podcast is to help people 
develop a dialogue and a narrative so that so that we can be in control of that narrative. So uh, share with our listeners why baiting black bears, why is it important, how does it serve wildlife management, and why do we need to keep it? Yeah, so baiting bears, black bears, I mean, it goes a it, it's it's not only just like a right it's it's cultural and, and and it's someone it's people's heritage for a lot of lot a lot a lot of years out here and especially in idaho and wyoming um and the state agencies have used it as a tool to harvest and manage black bear populations and so we put baits out on the national forest um where we can um legally uh, during hunting seasons in the spring and fall to try and harvest bait uh, bears and because of that, we harvest enough bears every year to where we don't have uh, issues. We still have a lot of issues with bears because they're an increasing population. But, you know, that's one way to manage. That's a tool in the toolbox, we say, um, for game managers, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, there's other tools, too, spot and stock hunting, hound hunting. There's a lot of tools they use, but we have to manage our wildlife. And, and hunting is part of that. And, and part of the legal ways to hunt in Wyoming and Idaho for bears is by using bait. And and it's an effective way. It, it, it provides the hunter an opportunity to watch the animal so they can be more selective, mm-hmm. you know, trying to shoot mature boars and not sows with cubs. And, and the, the arguments that these groups had on baiting were just so far-fetched. And, and they really just didn't do their homework on it. And that's why I thought this would go away, but they got it through, um, you know, the selectivity, the, the opportunity to, you know, harvest more mature animals. Um, it, it's just a really good means to to uh, provide opportunity for sportsmen and to manage populations how they want to you it's know hi- it's a highly effective a highly effective tool for wildlife management and uh it, when the people who are studying these black bears understand that they need to take so many bears off the landscape every year to manage that that properly and and baiting is an effective way for state wildlife managers to meet their goals correct so uh and then and in in some areas and and we i speak to idaho specifically you've been in that country and you know how thick and steep and and hard hunting that country is and if you only had spot and stock hunting in that country we are not taking enough bears out of the population that would give them them bears uh, a good healthy population where we're not um you know having too many bears and they're getting sick and then they're getting into conflict. Like we have to bait in certain areas of this country to, to have a harvest just because mm-hmm. it doesn't lend itself to spot and stock hunting. And, and you got parts of Idaho that you can shoot two bears a year. That's right. how robust right. our population is. And so baiting is a really good tool for that. And, and Wyoming, you know, this is the funny thing about this study is everyone's like, well, you can't, you can't kill a, a grizzly bear over black bear baits anyways. Well, in Wyoming and Idaho, you cannot bait black bears in the recovery area anyway. That's right. Uh, I was, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I was wanting to talk about that, but it was escaping me. So, Yeah, yeah, it's a funny thing. Like, we cannot legally bait black bears in the recovery area. That's mapped out. That's been mapped out since we the grizzly bears went on the ESA. But what's happening is our grizzly bear population is expanding, and they're moving into new areas where they've never been. It's not in the recovery area. It's outside the recovery area where we have black bear baits. And so you are going to have grizzly bears hitting black bear baits. It's just, unless we start managing grizzly bears, we're going to have it. There's just more bears. There's more grizz. There's more black bears. It's just, it's, you know, the populations are growing as such that we're going to have conflict. What are some of the things, I know Montana, before you purchase a a bear license for this, might be Idaho too, you have to take a bear uh, identification course yep. online yep you, they have bear identification courses and then in montana or in idaho and wyoming i know in wyoming specifically if you have a grizzly bear that hits your bear bait you're supposed to turn it in and close your bait down for the for the season mm-hmm. so there's a lot of um measures in place to prevent incidental accidental harvest um now is it a is it a tried and true fail safe method? No, there's no way of doing it because we we just can't control every sportsman that's out there. Even if they take the ID and they do everything in their power, sometimes it it could happen. Not saying it ever will again, but it could happen. Mm-hmm. And, and so you know when I look at what the states are doing to prevent this, to me that's enough to 
get this all taken care of. But they didn't go at the states individually. They went at a higher thing with the U.S. Forest Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Yeah, you know, the idea that that our argument against baiting is based on a what if just blows yeah. my mind. What if somebody shoots a grizzly bear? Yeah, we don't we, we, we don't regulate. I don't. I can't think of anything else that we ever create laws on based on what if this happens. Um, you know what I mean? A, 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 a hypothetical type type thing and and there's a lot of things that aren't regulated that have a lot more what ifs than a black bear hunter incidentally taking a grizzly bear yeah you you can't live on what ifs and it's just yeah if you look at our history and and this is one thing that i i think about this every day and it makes me crazy so it's a proven they know this now that there's probably more black bears in the united states than there was even before the first settlers came out to the west or before we even landed on the eastern seaboard mm -hmm. we have black bears in almost all 50 states of the union that's incredible we need we, also, we need some in indiana i'm just saying that so. yeah you might you guys might be the last place we also <laughs> have more grizzly bears than we've had since like the 60s and 50s now all this is happening while we're baiting and hunting bears so what's the one constant you, you got an increase in bear populations on both species and you're baiting and hunting. So it can't, just in the history, baiting can't have an adverse effect on populations. Right. I, I just don't know why that, why that's so hard for people to understand. It doesn't fit an agenda. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah, it doesn't fit the agenda of eliminating hunting from the landscape and from the management plans. That's, that's the ultimate agenda. The black bear and the issues around the grizzly, those are just pawns in the game. Yep. And and the grizzly bear is, and I kind of heard it firsthand, not from the one of the guys that's in this suit against us, but I tried to reach out and say, can we talk about maybe just what your misconceptions on bear baiting are? And they wanted nothing of it. You know, I tried to come to the table, say, hey, let's sit down and talk. We don't need to have lawsuits and this and that. And and they basically just said, you know, we, we don't like bear baiting and we're not going to stop until it's done. And now they're using a grizzly bear for it because they, they can't get it stopped any other way. And so they're going to use a grizzly bear. And if they get this done, what's next? You know, they're they're coming right at trapping and hound hunting. I mean, it's 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 already been happening. But, you know, sure. if we give them yeah. one inch, they're going to take a mile. So if they win one case and these guys are litigate happy, they're always suing. And they got multiple cases right now going on. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's not this one, they just got, they're doing one. with It's just nonstop with these groups. Right, right. You know, and, and the thing about baiting is it affects hound hunting, especially in Idaho, not not in Wyoming because, uh, you know, you don't, you don't pursue black bears with hounds in Wyoming. But in Idaho, I can tell you this past summer, you know, my, my buddy Larry, my buddy out there uh, was running two baits. And mm -hmm. uh, I was out there with him in the spring. <laughs> He'd been... He'd been running baits, uh, just two baits, but you got to get it. It's got to be 200 yards off of any improved road where you can have vehicle yep. access. So that means you're packing bait to it. I came yep. back and I, I mean, I thought he'd been on CrossFit workouts. You know, he'd, he'd dropped oh. weight and and so it's not an easy thing. And and he's a hound hunter and and um, I packed bait in and out of those areas and those locations for the purpose of being able to hound hunt. So it does have an effect on uh, the traditions of hound hunting, especially in the state of Idaho. Yes, it is It is an insane amount of work. And anyone that's not done it, I, 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 I offer them up a chance to come with me and I'll put them through uh, a, a pretty good ringer. It's a lot of money. And I yes. spot and stock hunt too. And I love spot and stock hunting more than anything. And it's a lot easier as far as like planning and cons you know consuming gas and all that stuff like just the cost and the amount of work and time put into baiting bears is is incredible <clears throat> so it's not an easy you know and and people have misconceptions we unload a truckload of donuts out on the landscape where everyone can see it you know there's guidelines and restrictions in these states that prevent mm -hmm. that you know because yep. the optic can be bad you know if 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 you don't pull your barrel out like you're supposed to and someone's out hiking and they see it in the summertime that that's a bad thing you know and so we have we have regulations in place to prevent a lot of this um, exactly it's just it's no different than baiting deer 
um, yeah. which we do yeah. in legally in the United States in some places, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, I think that's where I think that's a very key point right there. You know, it's easy for the deer hunter who, you know, you go to Illinois, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana does not allow baiting a deer, but any of the surrounding states, and um, when they see issues about baiting black bears and that's coming under challenge, they just kind of brush it off. It's like, oh, that's you know, that that doesn't affect me. I don't I don't have bear. I don't I don't bear hunt. The failure yep. is that. Once this is taken away, then the next thing is, is your bear baiting. Exactly. Or I'm sorry, I'm your deer, your, deer. your deer, deer baiting. You know, there's, there's even science that's, that's being pushed around about that. So, I mean, it, it behooves the whole sporting public to, to be awake and paying attention to the fact that bear baiting is under, under attack in Idaho and Montana right now. Well, and if we, I'll even take it to the next I'm level. Sorry. And, and Wyoming. There, there's something going on right now that should scare a lot of people. There's, you know, we lose baiting. Okay, that's that's a horrible situation. But mm-hmm. they're not going to stop at just bear baiting. It's right. any carnivore right. hunting is going to get under attack. And right now, there are two sisters suing the state of Washington for their recent bear hunting regulations. And that's spot and stock hunting. So it's just going to continue on forever and and it, if the only way to end it i think is to beat them in a lot of these cases and to beat them in enough to where they're just like you know it's the sportsmen are aligned finally which we are not exactly. because even in the bear hunting world we're we are segregated mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of guys that are spot and stock hunters that don't like bear baiting and there's a lot of bear baiters that don't like houndsmen and then there's right. vice versa and i'm like guys at the end of the day we're all bear hunters like that's the most important thing and let's put our differences aside on the method of take and focus on like we are losing battles here and why we're infighting these groups are taking advantage of that and and it's frustrating because i'm like yeah you might not like bear baiting and that is fine it's not for everyone and you might not believe in it whatever but if you're a bear hunter you better be helping us fight this right exactly and i want to go on record as saying that i love guys that sit in tree stands and maintain baits because as I'm rolling down those forest roads, I may not know your baits there, but my hound absolutely will strike off of your bait. So yeah. I, appreci- I appreciate your work, and I support you 100%. Well, and a lot of the hound hunting success in <laughs> Idaho is dependent on, you know, these houndsmen, you have to a lot of times are running multiple baits just to rig off of. You yes. know, and so you need that bait, or, you know, the harvest is going to go down tremendously if we're not baiting bears, and, and we're right. just going to see... They think it's going to help prevent nuisance bears because they said, oh, they're getting habituated to food. You watch if we lose baiting, how many bears are going to be in towns and cities and causing problems because the harvest is going to go down. It just is mm-hmm. science. Yes. Yeah, we'll take, we'll take bear baiting off, off of there, and then you know, we'll have to spend more money for professional wildlife managers to go out and manage conflicts with our bears. Yeah, which we would pay to do normally. Yeah, yeah, we'll have, we'll have any, that's right, that's right, so. Yeah, uh, it's a frustrating thing, and it, I, I haven't heard when they're going to, when she's going to hear it. Um, I get pretty up-to-date information on this case, you know, as it comes out, but I haven't, I haven't, they haven't set a date yet or anything, and so that's where we're at, and my fear of this whole thing is similar to the grizzly bear, and I don't, I'm not very good when it comes to court of law, and, and a lot of these litigation issues and suits and stuff but my fear is even if the judge takes a long time to rule on this they'll do something like they did with the grizzly bear hunt and file an injunction to stop it until she rules and that's what they did with the grizzly bear hunt right he took a long time to decide but they're like well the hunting season's coming let's we have to stop it and so they filed an injunction now i don't know if they can do that or if it can get by but that's something that's on my radar yeah, keep us keep me posted on that. You you send me all the uh, you keep me updated with that. I think you mm-hmm. forward all the information. Um, you have, you have, yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. Yep. So, yeah, I uh, I've been particularly paying attention to this, just because I see it as another foot in the door. And if it happens there, then it can happen in Wisconsin where they run baits, and it can. 
I don't know oh, how many. Any, yeah, anywhere. You know, we're the first ones of many on their list. Mm -hmm. um, they will, and they'll use the same formula. They'll figure out some way yep. that they can go away from the states. Because to me, issues like this should be brought up at the commission level. The people, the commission, and the agencies that are Amen. actually the, the smart people that know about the wildlife in these states and that are tasked with the, the recovery or the management of them should yes. be making these yeah. decisions. Well, these groups knew if they went and sat in front of the Game and Fish Commission in Wyoming, they'd have got laughed out of the room. So they said, we can't win at the level where sportsmen have to play. So we play in the commission and, and agency world, right? We want something done. We follow the steps. We go to the agency. We go to the commission. We ask for things. That's how we live. Well, these groups don't do that anymore. They know they'll lose, so they just go for litigation. And that's what they'll do in every state. That's that's the aggravating part for me is is why do you think you have a say in this? You don't live there. You know, I don't I don't get a say in how the Boston Marathon is run. I don't participate. I don't I don't have anything invested in that. So so when I look at these groups that want to try to impose themselves on from California or another, you know, liberal bastion out there that that wants to impose and tell people from Wyoming what they ought to be doing with their resource, man, that rubs me the wrong way and gets me fighting mad. Yeah, and it's just the whole thing in this world anymore. I, I started saying this a lot more. Just stay in your lane, you know. You live in your world, and we'll live in ours. And, and are black bears and grizzly bears a healthy population? Yep. I think sportsmen and the, the, the agencies are doing a fine job without your help trying to exactly. figure it out. Exactly. Yes, and and I always laugh because and I can never get one of these people in front of me, and I wish they hear this because, you know, if they <clears throat> if they really want to do something for wildlife, put it on the ground. They spend all their money trying to litigate and trying to raise money to litigate that they could all that money like if they wanted to do something for grizzly bears and black bears, put it on the ground. I don't see them spending any dollars towards you know, conservation or wildlife management that actually matters. It's all to litigate. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to push what they want, you know, yep. it, it goes back to what Jefferson Davis said, you know, about, he, he said, all, all we ask is to be left alone. That's all we ask. Yeah. Just leave us alone. <laughs> no, we just, we just, just mind your, own. we'll mind our business. We, I don't care if you, if you, what you want to do, on your time, just just leave me alone, you know. Exactly. I, We're doing fine out here managing wildlife that you can come take a picture of once in a while and yeah. see pictures on the internet, you know. And then, and they're still here. And as in the modern area, we haven't uh, we haven't put anything new on the endangered species list. And I think I think we have record numbers of deer and elk and bears, and that model seems to be working just fine. I yeah, think. wildlife has never been in such a great position as it has been since the North American model for wildlife conservation took effect. I mean, it's the greatest wildlife success story in the history of mankind. And yeah, we're more than happy to share it and let you come and take pictures and, you know, get mauled by a buffalo in, in Yellowstone State Park. Go for it. We Just don't tell us what we, we need to be doing. It's it's true. It's just it's just, I don't know. Like I, I I just couldn't imagine. I don't, I don't know how to put it into perspective. Like if we did something similar to them, they'd be like, "Where do you get off telling us?" Exactly. You know, like we don't meddle. I'm not worried about what they're doing, and I'm actually quite fine with whatever they're doing. But don't do this stuff. This is yeah. now. It's in our world. Yeah, you can't plant uh, Bradford pears in your yard anymore <laughs> in your subdivision. <laughs> Nobody. Yeah, we're not staying. We're not petitioning housing homeowner associations across the country saying you realize that Bradford pears are noxious substance that are blah 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 and trying to restrict them from what they're doing. Have your Bradford pear. Have fun with it. Yeah, and most sportsmen are kind of like you and I. Like they just want to be left alone. Yeah, they just want to be left alone. And like this is all stuff that we're dealing with now is not. It's stuff that takes us away from the outdoors and, and our passions. And now we have to do it. And all we want to do is be left alone. We mm -hmm. just leave us alone. And so that's where it's really hard, I think, is some sportsmen just get really jaded. They shut it off. And they just, they don't want to deal. And, and now we have to be more proactive and, and more, you know, 
I wish we weren't so reactive, but you can't see a lot of these things coming, you know, so right. we have to react, and, and that's what makes us hard. And, you know, aside from having – I get a lot of people say, what can we do? I said, we can't do anything right now. It's in the legal – it's in a court of law, and, and we don't have a lawyer, but we have lawyers – that are uh, representing groups that are going to fight for us. But, I mean, that's what's frustrating is, like, we can't call a commissioner now, and we can't – it's in a court of law. We have no say. Mm-hmm. Well, Joe, I can I, – I know that um, – I know it's frustrating. And, you know, we there's no doubt that you look at some of the – they've got – like you said earlier, we talked about other groups that had paid sta- have paid staff that – and the Western Bear Foundation does not, you know, when you look at some of the other organizations like NRA and, but make no mistake about it. These anti-hunting groups also have paid staff with attorneys on board. uh, And they can, that is their job to find these places where they can drive a wedge and, and further the agenda that they have. And that's what I think our hunters need to understand. I'd, I don't want to mess with it either. I don't want to. No. I don't want to make a podcast that talks about it. I want to talk about hunting. I want to talk about a big hunting adventure and all this other stuff. But if we're going to keep doing it, this is a life worth preserving, and the time has passed where we can simply sit back and roll down the 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 uh, switch back and and put it out of our minds. You know, it it it's here. It's now, and we need to be. We we can't allow any more defeat and any more loss of freedom no we're us. already losing so much yep 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 and so. i think what and i'm guilty of this when i was younger you know i i just kind of took for granted like someone was paying attention to it and fighting for me and i didn't really worry about it you know but sure everyone gets to a period in life where they get a passion or something that maybe they're like you know i i want to get more involved and and I think as sportsmen, we all have to just say, you know, I can't be dependent on someone else to take care of this for me. I need to be out there, you know, maybe bird hunting or, or whatever your passion is, like get involved. It doesn't have to be bears, but like find a group that's advocating for your sport or your hobby and ask them what you can do. Ask them to be involved because that's where we're, we're, uh, we're having, a, uh, having a, uh, problems as sportsmen, I think, is we can't let people do for us anymore. You know, the, the hunting public in general is not a is not a welfare crowd. You know, they, do, they yep. don't want people doing things for them. Uh, they no, wanna, they don't. They want to be proud. Yes, they want to be self-sufficient. Even more so, I've seen this in the hound, houndsman community, is they don't need handouts. They, a lot of them want to, they're too proud. They, they want to, the self-sufficient. But I think we need to realize at this point that we have done exactly that. We've sat back and we've hoped that somebody else was taking care of our problems on this level. And yep. now it's time. Those days are gone. It, it, those days are past. And yeah, we've got to find ways to be involved. And, and I just, you know, with kids coming up and, and new sportsmen, and there's, there's so many really fun and exciting things I think about taking my daughter to do that I've had the opportunity to do. And I look at, like, That could potentially, like, when I look at the fact that we may not be able to bait bears potentially soon, like, that's that's devastating to me because it's something that our family does as a group, as Mm -hmm. a unit. Like, it's part of our spring, and and we love it, and we love being out there and just the experience of being around bears and being close and learning about the species and stuff. My daughter loves it. My nephew, everyone that's in our family, we just get in on it. And, you know, the, the fact that that could be gone. Yeah is just devastating to me and i'm like what we can't allow that because then what's the next thing like we just said and and they won't stop and uh at least when i'm all said and gone and and done i can say i tried to do something even if it didn't work i just want to know that i tried to fight it for Uh, you're putting up a good fight we had carl chatel on a couple weeks ago from the uh uh, wisconsin bear hunters association and he talked about the convention that they have annually and he talked about the generations of hunters that come to these people bring their their kids their grandkids in some cases or great grandkids to the western or to the wisconsin bear hunters convention so and and baiting is huge i mean it's a it's a big i don't deal. know it's how a, you would hunt staple. bears in that state without it it's a staple and and so 
it needs to be on it needs to be on people's radar and people need to be paying attention because the the ninth circuit historically has not been kind to um uh, sportsmen no you're very spot on there and yeah. they pick the courts <laughs> yes they do pick the courts. Uh, there's a reason so why they're frustrating they're, there was a reason why they're running this through the ninth ninth circuit because they're going to set a precedent they're going to come up with a game plan and then they're going to start take they didn't go after the toughest toughest group or the toughest court first you know they picked no. they picked their court yep exactly and so. that's uh it's just a part of what we're trying to do is just bring awareness to stuff like this you know just so people understand what's going on so it's not a surprise um and that's a big part of it, you know, and we've had a lot of people reach out to us. How can I help? What can we do? You know, and I was like, just, you know, get involved with us and I'll make sure you're on the same page as I am. And when, when I hear stuff, you'll hear stuff. I said, unfortunately, right now, we did all the stuff that we could do <clears throat> before going to a court. So, you know, sending letters, talking to people and, and trying to get a gauge of what each state was going to do as far as fight it or not. And we kind of did all that stuff. And I said, you know, now it's out of our hands, unfortunately, but rest assured there'll be more fights coming you know always there'll always be the next fight yeah so what else you got joe not much buddy just been busy we got uh we got some cool things planned for the summer we had a really cool bear spray giveaway that got shut down because of covid over in uh in island park with multiple partners uh other nonprofit groups and that got shut down, so we're hoping we can do that this year. Uh, in I heard, Idaho, we're going to give away a lot of bear spray. I heard bear spray will kill COVID. I'd like to try it on a few people. I'm here yeah. to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get that rumor started. And Let's do it. <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll go to we'll go to Portland and Seattle and and Chicago and and just start passing it out. Just stand around with you, man. Hey, this will help a shot. anything you need. <laughs> Yeah, go. I didn't mean to derail that. What else you got going on with the Western Bear Foundation? Oh, we got some conflict mitigation stuff in Montana coming up this year, and then just that big raffle. Like that's going to be our year for us. So whatever we make on that, will will kind of determine what we can fund for projects on the ground. And always keeping up the fight for bears and bear hunters, man. I think we're kind of turned into the voice for bear hunters, especially out west. And 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 our goal is to not be just out west. We want to be everywhere, and and hopefully we can build our organize our, our group out enough to where one day we can, we can have a guy that's doing it full time or a gal that that represents Western Bear Foundation and and kind of keep growing our organization. And uh, I think we've done some really cool things and and uh, just kind of trying to be that voice for bears and bear hunters because they they bear hunters really don't have that loud of a voice when you look at some of these other groups. So, right. Right, it's and and uh, we, we got to break down some of that tribalism too. We've been talking about that a lot on the podcast. Um, you know, we can't afford to be pigeonholing ourselves as as spot and stall, bait hunters, hound hunters, deer hunters, elk hunters. We've all got a common thread here in world hunters, and and uh, that that should be enough at this point in the game to uh, unify unify sportsmen across the country and across across the globe, really. Yes, I, I I totally agree with you. Like this, the segregation of of sportsmen, it just can't happen anymore. Like we got to set aside whatever things that are bothering us, and and just or you know visit with someone, and maybe they'll help you understand a little differently. Sure. You yeah. know, like people that don't like bear baiting that are sportsmen, like happy to get on a phone call with you, happy to take you, like help you understand why mm -hmm. why we do mm -hmm. it and why we love it, and so so we can all get on the same page. And yeah, maybe you don't do it, but you will fight for it because it's a sportsman activity it's hunting at its core and if we lose anything for hunting we're, we're going to continue to lose right well joe why don't you uh why don't you uh tell our audience where they can find western bear foundation how they can get involved uh and and how they can support the western bear foundation you didn't even have to yeah. remind me i remembered <laughs> yeah so our website is westernbearfoundation.org uh we're on all the social media platforms facebook instagram I don't do Twitter. Um, we don't. I just don't know how to use it. So, <laughs> um, but we do uh, Facebook. A lot of our information comes out on Facebook and Instagram, and then through our membership program, that's how we generate some revenue. Um, you'll get email blasts from us on anything that's, uh, you know, any issues with bears or bear hunting or anything going on where we need to rally troops. That that comes through our email blasts on. Um, through our membership program and then anything that we have for sale or any raffles or fundraiser fundraisers are on 
westernbearfoundation.org, and they can donate directly on that page to us mm-hmm. if they don't want to buy anything and just do a donation. They can do it directly on that page. So, And because we're all volunteer, it all goes to work on the ground. Great. No overhead at the Western Bear Foundation. It's Not all going, much, that's for sure. It's all going straight to the uh, resource. That's awesome. That's, that's right. awesome. All right, Joe. Well, you got any, you, well, nothing. Nothing else? No, I'm ready for spring bear, man. I'm I'm looking forward to it. So I'm, re- I'm I, ready. I'm ready too. We just Count finished, the days, up, buddy. We just finished up a bear our West Virginia season uh, when it, just at the first of the year. So uh, I'm ready for Idaho to kick off, and and uh, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to roll. This is my daughter's first year hunting, so uh, we are. I'm putting all my eggs into getting her a bear, so we're pretty. I'm pretty excited for that, and she's yeah. been out a bunch, but I'm, I'm looking for her to try and harvest her first bear this year. And taking some more kids out and setting up a veteran hunt uh, out here in Wyoming with a group out of California. They're going to send a veteran up here, so we're going to do a lot of bear hunt in the spring, and I'm excited. That's awesome. That's awesome stuff. Well, Joe, we close this podcast out every week with the uh, this this uh, the same way, and uh, you're not a houndsman. But if you come if you come with me to hunt, if you ever if you ever make it across the uh, the Gibbonsville Road there, you can go over to Larry Anderson's. He's got eight hounds, and I'm sure he'll hand you a leash. I need so, to do that. So uh, whatever happens, you follow your hounds, and I'll follow mine. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. You bet.